congressional inaction. Why didn't the president take executive action on immigration back in 2009, 2010, when House Democrats failed act? Mm -hmm. Uh, because the president was committed to trying to work through Congress. I think this is evidence that the president's been very but patient. Two years. Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid, they were running the House and Senate. First two years of this administration, the president vowed back in 2008, by the end of my first year in office, we'll pass comprehensive immigration reform. That was his promise. Mm -hmm. So they, they failed to act for two years. Why didn't he do anything then? Well, I will say a couple things about that, Ed. The first is that the... Um, at the time, you recall back in 2009, there were many things on the president's plate. Uh, there was there now. Uh, Israel, Gaza, sure. Syria, uh, the I economy. Think, oh, it, he has a lot going on now, right? Uh, he does. You said several times here, we're focused on solving problems when you're asking we about it. We're focused on we So are. you had a chance, you had the House, Senate, and White House, 2009, 2010. Why didn't you focus on solving immigration problems then? Uh, and my point is, Ed, that there were a lot of other uh, crises that the president was focused on at that point. Uh, and what we're focused on now is trying to find uh, common sense solutions, bipartisan solutions, to a problem that, uh, that a wide variety, a wide majority of Americans acknowledge exists at this point. From hurricane shelters being used to house illegal immigrants to border patrol agents caught on video basically telling someone what they're doing is having little or no effect on stopping anyone at any time. The southern border crisis hasn't gone away just because we're clocking other items and discourses around the world. To the people who live there, this is daily life dealing with a drastic change in a way of life. And often with no hope anything will ever return to what they remember as normal. Let's go around the dial. Let's welcome in from 660 The Answer in Dallas, Texas, one of my favorite cities. And nationally syndicated on Morning in America, Mark Davis is in the house. Mark, thanks for joining us. Ed, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mark, here we go. We have a presidential spokesman saying, well, the problems are here. There's just too many crises right now. We simply can't just, deal with this. I, I can only zone. imagine it's, what the people are saying crazy. in Dallas. There's just too much going on. Uh, <laughs> let us stipulate that at any given moment in time, under, Demo uh, under Democrat and Republican administrations, there will always be a lot of problems. There will always be a lot going on. But you know what? There's a better answer the White House could give, and I think everyone would nod in agreement. Here it is. In 2009 and 2010, when we, the Democrats, had one party rule, they could say, uh, it wasn't front of mind. It wasn't sufficiently front of mind for us. It wasn't sufficiently front of mind in the Bush administration when he had a Republican White House, Republican House, and Republican Senate. This is a problem nobody wants to solve. Democrats don't want to solve it because they like open borders. Republicans don't want to solve it because they're scared to death that their solutions will alienate Hispanic voters. So a burst of honesty like that and we could avoid the crazy rigmarole of, of the video that you just played. So with a burst of honesty like that, is that what you're getting from the people in Dallas, Texas, and your listeners? Because I, I've got to believe that what we're just hearing right now, that there's too many crises, we can't deal with this, and certainly now we're talking about more tax dollars and more efforts going to this, that the people down there have got to be screaming bloody murder. Well, it's funny. We've just been through a very interesting chapter. Uh, sitting here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, I'm seven hours from the actual border, but the impact was going to be felt right here in the DFW area with the arrival of about 2,000 border kids, local Democrats. We do have Democrats here. We just don't let them run the state. Local Democrats had paved a yellow brick road uh, for the arrival of about 2,000 border kids, and we were going to house them. Lord only knows how this would have worked out. We were going to house them in old schools and decrepit old buildings. It was crazy. Anyway, just a few days ago, we were told it's not going to happen anymore. The border kids are not coming. The reasons given were that the border's much better, that, that we got beds aplenty, the, 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 the influx of people is not as, uh, as great, and so we don't have to bring the border kids to DFW. We all know the real reason was they knew it would be vastly unpopular, so around here at least, those of us who believe in strong borders and believe in obeying our immigration laws are chalking up a small victory. How scared are the people there when we hear things such as Ebola might be crossing the border, which hasn't been proven whatsoever. It simply is hyperbole. We hear all these diseases and scabies and MS-13s crossing the border, and there's people coming in here from Libya and Syria. Is anybody really scared down there about this? Uh, well, let, let's call it concerned, okay. and let's take those many, many things that you mentioned and sort of break them down. Is there a risk of a bunch of kids coming in who might not be exactly up on their vaccinations bringing in a health risk. Yes. Is it a big enough health risk that it's like a Stephen King novel is going to break out? No. But is it a concern? Sure it is. If you move to terrorism, 
I got to tell you, this this is a lot of what Governor Perry has been talking about lately, and properly so. Uh, if it's really easy to get in the southern border of the United States, there's a long list of people who will notice that. Folks from Mexico, folks from Central America, folks from Iraq, folks from Afghanistan, folks from ISIS, folks from Al Qaeda. So I think it's foolish to suggest that that's not a risk that is part of the reason why we need a really, really strong border. I want to look at President Obama's approval ratings here, and I will have a follow-up question, of course, on this. Overall, 40 percent, an all-time low on the economy, 42 percent, approving of his foreign policy, 36 percent. Do I perhaps guess correctly, I hate to use the word assume, that perhaps those numbers might even be a little bit lower in your audience and the folks no, in Dallas Fort Worth. <laughs> Some they say don't don't they say don't be <laughs> presumptuous, but that's really not a presumption. I, I mean, let it, let us stipulate that those those numbers are probably better in Massachusetts or Northern California, and they are decidedly worse here. We are a red state. I mean, I just cranked out a, a book called Lone Star America, which is a, essentially a treatise that says if America were run like Texas, we'd be a little less screwed up. And it's because we have had delicious one-party rule for 20 years. There are people, uh, there's an outfit called Battleground Texas that is trying, trying uh, to turn us uh, purple and then blue. That's not going to happen short term, but it's a fight we have to face because no nothing is forever in politics. I got about 45 seconds left here. Do I guess then that if the election were held tomorrow, the people in Texas would overwhelmingly vote for Governor Perry? Uh, not so fast. Governor mm. Perry is very, very popular, but we got another rock star down here in Ted Cruz and also sitting there doing 2016 Derby early talk. There's a lot of love in Texas for all kinds of constitutional conservatives. Scott Walker in Wisconsin, Bobby Jindal right next door, Dr. Ben Carson. Governor Perry's getting a lot of love lately. The National Guard deployment was a good thing, but he's not the automatic favorite son, but it would be, it would be foolish to underestimate him. You have just told us something that we did not expect to hear. We are led to believe by many people that Governor Perry is the choice. Well, I, I live to serve, and it's funny. When you've been governor of a state for 15 years and things are going as well as they are in Texas, you'll have people who love you, but you'll also have your share of detractors, too. It, it won't be an e Now, if he's the nominee, of course, but it, once, once we got 10 guys running, he'll get attention from Texans, but so will some other folks, too. So the eyeglasses haven't locked it up yet for him. <laughs> And I got a pair of those, too. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. I going to say, go ahead, tell them yours. Maybe you can switch off. I don't know. Give, give them your pair of glasses. It might work. I should have worn You never know. Hey, Mark Davis, 660 The Answer, Dallas Fort Worth. Thanks so much, Mark. A pleasure. We'll do it again soon. It's my great joy. Thank you. All right, take care. Around the dial with Mark Davis. Next hour on Midpoint. How many times recently have you boarded an airplane and thought how safe you really are? It's not just the commercial planes these days. That and a whole lot more coming up as Midpoint questions everything.